Hi, all. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm back with a bonus episode. Now, don't get too excited. This bonus episode is arriving in your ears because, well, the next full-length episode will be delayed. You see, I didn't plan far enough ahead and I'm going on a trip this weekend, which takes away all my time to write and record a full-length episode. I know, I'm the worst, but I threw out my back this past weekend and because of that, could do absolutely nothing. It was super fun. Also, the reason I'll be busy is I'm traveling to Ontario and will be watching Stephen Fry's Mythos show at the Shaw Festival. So you know what? It's a perfectly acceptable excuse for a delayed episode. So enjoy, and I will be back with you again with a full-length episode soon. Now, I'm here with this particular bonus episode because I've been a bit inspired as of late. I've had a couple of emails recently about the concept of chronology when it comes to Greek mythology. And while I don't have an entirely satisfying explanation to provide you all with, I thought I'd try to educate myself and bring the concept of time into this maniacal podcast I've created. First, a warning. This episode contains spoilers, if you can call them that, for many previous episodes. It's an explainer episode, if you will. So if you haven't listened to most, if not all, of my previous episodes, it's not going to make much sense. Mini-myth. Orpheus, Kronos, and why you shouldn't try to figure out the chronology of Greek myths. In order to delve into today's primary character, Kronos, not to be confused with, well, Kronos, yeah, I know, I'll get into it. But first, there's something I didn't tell you about Orpheus when I covered his tragic romance with Eurydice all those many months ago. You see, Orpheus is also considered the founder of a religion. He was a prophet, with priests and disciples who committed to writing down his holy words long before that other guy who was a prophet and had priests and disciples who committed to writing down his holy words. There are many versions about Orpheus' life. Different ways he died, and different gods he was associated with. It was either Apollo or Dionysus, and I won't get into the nitty-gritties of the other bits, because, frankly, this isn't about Orpheus. This is about me explaining that there was a religion associated with Orpheus who was, in the 5th century BCE, accepted as a human religious teacher. At this time, in the 5th century, there were doctrines associated with his teaching, teaching that came from a much earlier time. There were, apparently, tablets found in the mountains of Thrace that contained his writing, charms, incantations, and spells. Plato quoted lines from Orpheus and spoke of priests who taught his message. Later, there are songs about the gods and the beginning of everything that are attributed to Orpheus. He became an incredibly important figure during this time, far more than a character in a story about a woman he lost by being stupid in the underworld. We don't know everything about this religion associated with Orpheus, the Orphic tradition, but we do know some things. There is, even, an Orphic theogony. That is, a story of the beginning of everything that comes from the Orphic tradition rather than the commonly understood theogony that primarily comes from one of the very first misogynists himself, Hesiod. Hesiod's theogony is what I told you all about way back in the first episode. This is another theogony, and it tells of a god named Kronos. Not Kronos. Yeah, I know. I'll get there. According to the Orphic tradition, in the beginning, there was Kronos. Kronos with a C-H and an O-S at the end. Kronos as in time. The concept of time in a person though not really a person, because he's sometimes considered to have had the heads of a bull and a lion with a god's face nestled comfortably in between. From this Kronos, time, came Ether, who is the personification of the sky, space, and heaven. Chaos, who is nothingness, personified, and Erebus, darkness. In Ether, 
I'm picturing ether as space in the scenario. Kronos made an egg. That egg split in two, and from it was born Fanny's, the creator. Fanny's is also called Eros. This is the version of Eros who is not the son of Aphrodite and Ares, but a primordial Eros. This Eros was bisexual, and he had golden wings and four eyes, so he was pretty fucking cool, let's be honest. Fanny's, or Eros, had a daughter, Night, or Nyx. She was his partner, and then his successor. Nyx gave birth to Gaia and Uranus, and from there things resemble Hesiod's version, which you can hear me tell in the early days of episode one of this podcast. Sometimes I think about rewriting and recording some of those episodes because I'm better at this now and they're important stories, but that's an idea for another time. Of course, from Gaia and Uranus came the Titans, and that's where Cronus, without the CH, comes into play. Things veer off from the standard story again when, in this version, Zeus has sex with Persephone, who in the other version is his daughter, but it's not clear who she is in this one, so we'll just hope she's not. And from that union, in this case, is born Dionysus, who is super important in this Orphic tradition. And, well, that seems to be basically it for Kronos, time Kronos. I keep thinking there must be more to him story-wise, but I've consulted all the books I have and can't find more details. But I can tell you that his name is where we get the word chronology and everything that stems from it. According to Wikipedia, he was sometimes confused with the other Kronos, the Child Eater, in ancient times, though I find that hard to believe and have found contradicting evidence in one of my sources. But I will say that he certainly has been confused with the Child Eater Kronos later, which is where we get the concept of father time. There's also lots of Renaissance art that depicts them as one and the same. This father time weirdo with the scythe, which is for sure conflating the two. So, with that unwieldy introduction through a god that's the concept of time but doesn't really have much to do with time or chronology in the story about him, I present you with an unsatisfying answer to the unending question of chronology in Greek mythology. And that is, don't think about it too hard. They didn't. See, some of the myths you can pretty easily put into chronological order. The original Theogony, for example. This is how things came to be. Here is how the gods were born. Then they did some bad stuff. It's simply linear. It's when you try to understand the stories of the heroes and how they interact with each other and with other things the gods did, that's where you run into some trouble. For instance, I'm going to provide you all with a magnificent rundown that was sent to me a while back. This was sent to me by Juliana. She pieced together that in the story of Heracles, we learned about Megara, and that Megara was a princess of Thebes, daughter of Creon, and that this was the Creon of Oedipus' story, and that that means that Heracles must have married Megara after the Oedipus craziness, and that after Oedipus leaves Thebes, he meets an older Theseus. So that must have happened after Theseus met his father. And who was his father's wife when Theseus met him? Medea. So before that happened, Medea killed her children with Jason before fleeing to Athens and meeting Theseus' father. But Heracles was one of the Argonauts who sailed with Jason before he even met Medea. Heracles must have had to marry Megara when he was super old because there was enough time for Medea to have met Jason, killed their children, gone to Athens to meet Theseus' father, fucked that shit up, and then Theseus had time to grow super old and meet Oedipus who had only just left Creon whose daughter was Megara. Did that make sense? Seriously, there's just so much to take in. But honestly, I'm blown away that Juliana put this together because frankly, I'd never given it this much thought, so thank you. But it might be because I'm used to Greek mythology. And so while it could be possible that Heracles was super old when he met Megara, he was a demigod after all, the far more likely answer is simply the myths changed over time. The most well-known story of Jason and the Argonauts comes from Apollonius of Rhodes. He was writing in the 3rd century BCE. 
In this story, it's clear that Heracles was left on that island during the quest for the Golden Fleece, so that he had the chance to complete the Twelve Labors, but, of course, the Twelve Labors take place after he has already accidentally killed Megara. Of course, the confusion doesn't stop with Heracles. There's the story of Phaethon, as was mentioned to me by Lara, another confused soul seeking chronological guidance. The story of Phaethon describes some of the creation of Earth, so it must come early in the world. But at the same time, so many other things are established. The story of Daphne. It tells the story of the creation of a very important tree. It must come early. But does it? Honestly, so many of these stories are standalones. They explain something, they involve gods you know and maybe love, but probably think are creeps, but they don't fit in with any succinct timeline. We could try to understand the chronology forever, but it would be fruitless. With Apollonius of Rhodes writing so late in the Greek world, I would bet that the inclusion of Heracles was his, and not necessarily based on the original story of Jason. Maybe he wanted to add a little pizzazz. Maybe I'm totally wrong. This is all speculation here. But honestly, the age-old answer of these were myths passed down for hundreds or even thousands of years, usually in the oral tradition with one poet telling the story to groups of people and those people passing it on, and further poets telling further versions, and so on and so on and so on. Details changed, details were added or removed. It's like an ancient version of the telephone game, but with intricate and fascinating stories that feel so real and so detailed that they feel like they must have remained the same for that long. But they didn't. As far as I know in all my readings and my schoolings, there is no timeline. There is no real chronology. There are stories, some interact, some are at odds with one another, some fit, some make zero sense at all when you try to include them amongst the others. There's just no reasoning with these ancient Greeks. Well, wasn't that a weird episode? Thank you all for listening. Honestly, I've now had a few emails about chronology, and it's never something I've really thought about before. I'm not sure why. I'm usually a stickler for those kind of things. I think I might have just known enough about the backstory of these myths to understand that you just can't understand any kind of timeline, so I never tried. But I realize for those without a background in classics and the origin of these things that that might be a stretch. Also, a disclaimer. The first half of this episode, the nonsensical introduction to time, does come from standard sources. They're listed in the show notes, but are primarily a textbook I still have from university. When it comes to the general timeline and explanations, though, that's all me, based on what I know, what I've read, and my own understanding of these things. I'm not an expert, but I like to think I know my stuff. There is no obvious source on how to understand the timeline of Greek mythology. I think for the reasons I outlined above, there just aren't any. But that's all to say, I could be wrong, who knows, but I don't think I am. Thank you all for listening. You're all wonderful. And like I mentioned, I'll be back with a full length episode very soon. I'll even talk about Stephen Fry and his Greek mythology. I'm Liv, and I love this shit. <laughs>